my time is correct, we're at just a minute or two after half past, so those people right at the back, can you hear me okay there? Otherwise, you could always come a little forward. I see that hand. Okay, we're all good. So welcome to Trinity Reformed Baptist Church, 102 visitors. Uh, we're starting, as you know, with a study of the book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, and uh, I do recommend this book as one to reference uh, in your preparation for our study each week, not necessarily to have it here and to be reading it, but uh, just to read ahead if you like, and I'll let you know what we're going to be studying in the following weeks, uh, but it's just a wonderful book to have, and as we go through the remedies over the uh, next weeks uh, ahead, you'll find that they really are precious remedies, and to know Satan's devices and these, um, it's really a special book, and the only book I'm aware of that's been written on this subject by uh, Thomas Brooks, and it's written in 17th century English, so um, for a lot of the, the, the presentation, I'm going to use the original when I'm quoting him, but as we go along, I will kind of translate that into 21st century English, so... Uh, but it's uh, delightful to read, and I, I highly recommend that book. So before we start our study, and today we're not actually getting into the first remedies, uh, uh, Satan's remedies, but we're going to have just an introduction to this lesson, a little bit of history on Thomas Brooks, some helpful things, and Pastor Sam and I will be discussing, of course, this is right up his street and his uh, thesis, his hobby, if you like, so he was able to give me some nice pictures, some pictures of manuscripts, which we'll be showing you. So that was helpful, too, uh, in our study. So that's what we're going to be doing today, the introduction, some history, and we're going to look at the reasons he wrote this, that he cites, and some notes to his readers. So as you, if you have the book, if you can start reading it, there's some helpful hints for you, too. So maybe a short lesson. I planned it to be short, but can't promise that. Um, before we start, and then for next week, we actually have a visiting speaker from, um, no, that is for the afternoon. Ignore that. Next, uh, I may as well tell you, we have um, Caesar Augustus, not the Caesar Augustus, he's from Cuba, and Sam went to uh, teach in Cuba uh, in year, last year, I think it was. Um, he's coming to visit us, and will be uh, preaching for us or giving a presentation next Lord's Day afternoon. So we will start next week, Lord willing, on the first, maybe the first three devices, if you want to read ahead for next week, and we'll see how we go. Uh, that's how I've planned it. I'm not sure how it's going to actually work out. So before we start today, let's close the opening word of prayer. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for men who have gone before us, men who have served you, men who have carried the torch of the gospel, and men who have written for us down through history uh, helpful books and uh, studies to help us in our Christian work, walk, to understand your word more carefully and to be better prepared against the wiles of Satan, even our own flesh and, and the world that would lure us away. We pray that you would be with us in this study we pray it would, would be beneficial to each one of us and cause us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us in this hour. Be with us as, we, as we've come to worship you this day. Spirit of God, would you come and be with us in the preaching of the word, in the reading of scripture, and the singing of praises to you in our fellowship together. Uh, hear our prayer, for we long to worship you as you desire in spirit and in truth, and we ask these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. All right, we have the first slide coming up. I'm going to just put these right for Notes. All right, so Thomas Brooks, 1606 
to, down to 1627, uh, 1680, his birth date. So, second slide, please. So, as far as we can tell, uh, it doesn't appear that Thomas Brooks was from any kind of noble birth or from a wealthy family at all. He was born in 1606, as we've seen, and he entered Emmanuel College in Cambridge in 1625. And uh, that's how we know he was from no kind of noble birth or wealthy family. He entered, he didn't have grants or scholarship, but had to pay his own way. And then some other famous Puritans, uh, such as Thomas Hooker, John Cotton, and Thomas Shepherd, were also educated at this Emmanuel College, Cambridge. Uh, but unfortunately, it looks like Thomas Brooks actually left the college before he even graduated, and the reason for that is unknown. But in any event, he was ordained as a preacher of the gospel in, six, at, in 1640 at the age of 34, became a chaplain to the parliamentary fleet. So he was an independent minister there in England, and his first assignment was to the parliamentary free fleet. And serving some years at sea, Thomas Brooks actually says at one point, and I quote, I've been some years at sea, and through grace I can say that I would not exchange my sea experiences for all England's riches. So and there's some writings, too, about his uh, experiences in ministry at sea. So Brooks, well, he was a steadfast supporter of the independence and the army. And in 1647, and again in 1651, he joined a group of independent ministers and Baptist churches in issuing two declarations, which, among other things, they openly espoused the principle of rule by the godly and within each church, ruling that church as opposed to the Presbyterian kind of system or the Church of England system, which had kind of fallen apart with the Civil War, uh, and so this principle of rule by the godly. After the Civil War in England, Brooks became a minister the Church of St. Thomas the Apostle in Queen Street, London, from that was 1648 to 1651. He was often to call to preach before Parliament. In 1652, he became minister to St. Margaret's New Fish Street, Fish, Fish Street Hill, which was the first church to be burnt down during the Great Fire of London in 1966. And... Uh, there's an interesting story about this church back in 1648 when he first went to St. Margaret's. He was, in fact, called to this church, the Fish Hill Street Church, and things didn't work out there. So listen to this quote. He laid down some, and this is in his negotiations with the church at Fish Hill in 1648, where he was kind of elected to become the minister, entered into negotiations with them, it didn't work out. He laid down some uncompromising terms for his acceptance of the charge, all of which were independent in nature. He requested that the parish elders who'd been chosen under the Presbyterian system should all resign, and that godly people of the parish should gather together and own one another's grace in conference, and that they should receive godly strangers, though differing in opinion, into their church. So basically he was saying, we're going to shut this down and start all over again, but yes, I'll come to your church. Furthermore, he declared that he would offer the sacrament only to members of this newly constituted church and baptize only their children. And he was not a Baptist, as, as you figured. In effect, it, he was to transform the parochial church into an independent congregation. As a result, as you can imagine, the negotiation failed. Now, Brooks, like Thomas Goodwin and John Owen, preferred the congregational view of church government as opposed to the Presbyterian system or the Church of England uh, kind of synod rule. And as a result, in 1662, he fell victim to the notorious Act of Uniformity, which you may have heard about, which was an Act of Parliament under Charles II. And I quote, it prescribed the form of public prayers, administration of the sacraments, and other rites 
of the then re-established Church of England according to the rites and ceremonies prescribed in the Book of Common Prayer. Adherence to this was required in order to hold any office uh, in government of the church. And so at this time, a lot of ministers were evicted from their living and kicked out of the churches as the state church, if you like, came back into power. So Brooks, after being ejected from his living, continued to preach in London and suffered some persecution. Then he became a minister of the congregation at Moorfields, near, near to St. Margaret's. And un- unlike many of the other ministers at the time, uh, during the Great Plague of 1665, I don't know what your British history is like, mine's horrible, so I just learned as I went along. So the Great Plague, London 1665, a lot of the ministers just ran out and headed into the country and just got out of London as this terrible plague uh, ravaged the city. But Brooks remained through that whole time faithfully tending his flock. And this was the kind of man that he was. The Great Plague, lasting from 1665 to 66, two years, was the last major epidemic of the bubonic plague to occur in England, which began in Europe around the 1300s already. So this uh, lasted kind of three centuries and the first year, the Black Death, an outbreak which included other forms of the, such as the pneumonic plague, lasted until 1750. And uh, this great plague that we're talking about, where most of the ministers actually fled, uh, killed an estimated 100,000 people, almost a quarter of London's population in 18 months. So it was quite terrible. It was caused by, there's a long name, but uh, which won't mean anything to you unless you're a doctor, Uh, but it basically was transmitted by the bite of an infected rat flea. And and this disease, so just from a flea that bites you, that came from one of the rats that were infected, uh, would wipe out a quarter of London's population at that time. And Thomas Brooks stayed through that time faithfully tending his congregation. So, third slide. Now, uh, we haven't even mentioned, but Thomas Brooks was married twice in his life. There's no account of of any children. And his first wife, he lost his first wife, uh, wife Martha Burgess, in 1676, a godly woman which he greatly treasured. He wrote of her, she was always best when she was most with God, in a corner. She has many a whole day been pouring out her soul before God for the nation, for Zion, for the church, and the great concerns of her own soul. So there's not a whole lot written, but Thomas Brooks wrote this about his first wife who died then. Um, And there's some notes about that where she was buried in the center's burial ground, the famous burial ground. Uh, on 23rd of June, 1676. Next slide. So Thomas Brooks later married a God-fearing woman named Patience Quatra. All right, I'm not sure if she had to have a lot of patience with him, but anyway, that was her name. Uh, and in the works of Thomas Brooks, uh, Grossard is uh, works which are like 3,000 pages, I think six volumes. Uh, Grossard puts it succinctly. He says... She, spring young, he, winter old. So there we go. Uh, Older men, you may choose for yourself a spring young wife, if you so wish. (laughs) And um, the next slide, uh, in fact, yes, this slide, Thomas Brooks, that's where she was married in, in, um, over in the wall. And if you can see, that's the great... Wall of London in between uh, the the In the Wall Church and the Paddy France Church, which you've heard about, uh, which Pastor Sam has spoken about. And, uh, of course, the Paddy France Church, Thomas Brooks could at that time, when he married his wife right there, uh, just walk through the gate of the Great Wall and walk over to the Paddy France Church and just say hi to Nehemiah Cox. 
And of course, being 1677, what was happening during 1677? The confession, the confession was being written, although it was only the confession of 1689 and 77, it was being written. So there perhaps was Nehemiah Cox dipping his pen in the ink and uh, Thomas Brooks could just walk over after his wedding and say hi to Nehemiah and the lads, the particular Baptists, just on the other side of the wall. Quite an interesting picture which uh, Pastor Sam said, sent to me. And, and I believe, Pastor Kirk, you've visited the Petty France Church when you were in England. Did you not? Yeah, right. right, okay, so there it is, right here. Slide number five. <clears throat> so here's the text. I'm uh, sorry, Brooks died on 27th September 1680. 72 years old, was buried in that same cemetery, Bunhill Fields. London's famous nonconformist cemetery. Slide, next slide. <clears throat> Sorry, the one before that, the slide before that. Yeah, the one before that, I seem to have missed one there. Okay, the next one. Cause of death, Bunhill Fields, 1st of October, 1680. All right, next slide. Um, the text of the funeral sermon at, at his burial was Philippians 3, 21, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Uh, next slide. Okay, sorry, one back. I'm a little bit, should have made some more notes here. Okay, there's the Philippians reference and the announcement of the funeral of Thomas Brooks. Thank you. Next slide. So John Reeves, who preached at the funeral of Brooks, said he had a sweet nature, great gravity, large charity, wonderful patience, and a strong faith. And then our second paragraph up there, a person of wonderful patience, notwithstanding the many weaknesses and infirmities for which a long time have been continually without ceasing, as it were, trying their skill to pull down his frail body to the dust, dust, and at last affected it. Yet I never heard an impatient word drop from him. When I came to visit him and asked him, how do you do, sir? He answered, this is on his deathbed pretty well. Uh, pretty well, I bless God, I'm well, I'm contented with the will of my Father. Next slide. As a fellow minister said of Brooks, an experienced minister, from the heart to the heart, from the conscience to the conscience, he had a body of divinity in his head and the power of it upon his heart. And he is now at rest. Though he is gone, he is not lost. He's useful to the church of God, and being dead, he yet speaks by his example and writings, which were very profitable and spiritual. So a wonderful man of God, and his legacy, what he wanted to be his legacy, was to continue to serve the church of Christ. And here we are, 400-something years later, benefiting from one of his books, Precious Remedies, against Satan's devices. The next slide gives us some of the writings of Thomas Brooks. And the works of Thomas Brooks contain those six volumes, 3,000 pages. And some of these more popular and famous works, uh, Heaven on Earth, which is on assurance, The Mute Christian Under the Smarting Rod, Apples of Gold, A String of Pearls, uh, precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And then Spurgeon, the last book, which is on here, Smooth Stones Taken from Ancient Brooks, was not written by him, but in fact compiled by Charles Spurgeon, and it was a combination of sayings and quotes from his writings and from his sermons. I'd love to get my hands onto that. That could be a useful book. So the next two slides... And there we have the one book, Apples of Gold, The String of Pearls, and these, uh, Pastor Sam said to, said to me, as you can imagine, 
the next slide. There's the book we're going to study, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices and um, Heaven on Earth on Assurance. Right, slide number 12, or the next slide, thank you. So in the, if you've read the introduction to this book, uh, Thomas Brooks gives us seven reasons uh, for writing these precious remedies against Satan's devices. And these are the things that prompted him to write this. Um, first of all, because Satan has a greater influence upon men, higher advantages over them than they think he has, and the knowledge of his higher advantage is the highway to disappoint him and to render the soul stronger in resisting and happy in conquering. In other words, know your enemy. Know your enemy. And so this is one of the reasons and the fact that men think that Satan is not as powerful as he is. And we sometimes as Christians think, well, I can stand up to him because Christ has conquered Satan. Well, the Bible warns us that he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so this is one of the reasons he wrote this. Satan is a lot more powerful than we realize. And we are no match for him. Of course, Christ has conquered him, but he is still in the world. And Christ has him on a short lease. And he is there to trip us up and to sometimes not as a roaring lion, but as a wolf in sheep's clothing so that we don't even recognize him and see him coming. And as we fall into sin, we think to ourselves, how stupid can I be for doing that? And Satan has tripped us up. Secondly, uh, he, and, I'm, and I'm reading the 6th, 17th century English, your importunity and the importunity of many other precious sons of Zion has after much striving with God, with my own heart and with others, made a conquest of me and forced me to do that at last, which was not a little contrary to my inclination and resolution. In other words, a lot of people asked him to write on this subject, perhaps as a result of his preaching, and they just thought there would be great benefit, and so he did what he eventually wanted to do, and he put pen to paper. The third thing, he writes, the strange opposition that I met with from Satan in the study of this following discourse has put an edge on my spirit, knowing that Satan strives mightily to keep these things from seeing the light that end eminently to shake and break his kingdom of darkness and to lift up the kingdom and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in the souls, the lives of men. So Thomas Brooks was acutely aware of kind of almost the attack of Satan in preventing him, perhaps by postponement, perhaps by uh, just putting this off or just not getting down to it and leaving it unattended. And that just gave him more resolve uh, that these things should come to light, these remedies uh, against Satan's very real devices there. Then the fourth reason, it's exceeding usefulness to all sorts of, ranks and conditions of men in the world. Here you had the soul for every sore and the plaster for every wound and a remedy against every disease, especially those that tend mostly to the undoing of souls and the ruin of the state. And as we go along and look at these remedies, you'll really appreciate that for every uh, area of your life, every stage of your life that you're in uh, and the sins and the temptations of your youth may, as a 50 and 60 year old man or woman in this age, not be the temptations that are strong to you today. Uh, they may be, but others come. And so, for every stage of life, there are some warnings of Satan's devices and those precious remedies against them. Next reason to go for writing this is. I haven't seen anyone write about this. I'm not aware of anyone writing about this. And so that prompted him to write this book. And then the next reason is he says, I have many precious friends in several countries who desire us that my pen should reach them. Now that my voice cannot, I have formerly been by the help of Almighty God of Jacob, a weak instrument of good to them, 
and cannot but hope and believe that the Lord will also bless these labors to them, they being in part the fruit of their desires and prayers. In other words, he had friends all over the world, people who'd heard him, who'd moved away, could no longer hear his voice. There was no sermon audio, there's no internet, and he said, well, they could benefit from this at last. And then the last reason, basically I will read it, but basically saying that his time is running out on this earth and his usefulness to the church is coming to an end. And this is what he wants to be his legacy, to serve Christ even when he's gone. Lastly, not knowing how soon my hourly grog glass will run out, how soon I may be cut off by hand of death from all opportunities of doing further service for Christ or your souls in this world, I was willing to sow a little spiritual seed among you, that so when I put off this earthly tabernacle, my love to you and that dear remembrance of you, which I have in my soul, may strongly engage your minds and your spirits to make this book your companion, and all internal and external changes, to make use of this heavenly salve, which I hope will, by the blessing of the Lord, be as effectual for the healing of all your wounds as their looking up to the bronze servant was effectual to heal theirs who were bit by and stung with fiery serpents. I will leave this book to you as a legacy of my dearest love, desiring the Lord to make it far greater and sweeter legacy than all those carnal legacies that are left by the high and mighty ones of the earth to their nearest and dearest relations. Well, there's some great reasons, and maybe this will encourage you to put something in paper, start a journal, and write something of your life. And I can highly recommend a book I just read last week, Carried by Grace, by a very famous new author right here in our midst. We recommend Brent Schuben's book to you about his trials. Uh, and it is this kind of thing that prompted him to uh, that Others may benefit uh, from their studies, from his experiences. And so the next slide, which is a word to the reader, and uh, if you've read the introduction to this, you would have seen this. Uh, Psalm 119, and verse 111 says, Your testimonies are my heritage forever. They are a joy to my heart. And he writes, It is the legacy that our forefathers have bought with their blood, which would make us willing to lay down anything that we may with a wise merchant to the gospel purchase this precious pearl which is worth more than heaven and earth and which will make a man live happily, die comfortably and reign eternally. And so Brooks comes just before he starts these uh, remedies against Satan's devices. He says, if you please read the work and receive this counsel from me. He says, every man cannot be excellent, but every man can be useful. An iron key may unlock the door with a golden treasure behind it. Yes, iron can do some things that gold cannot. Secondly, remember it is not hasty reading. And if you've started reading the book, you kind of got to read some of these paragraphs two or three times, uh, and not just because of the English, uh, ancient English ruse, but seriously meditating upon heavenly truths and make them prove sweet and profitable to the soul. It's not the bees touching the flower which gathers honey, but her abiding for a time upon the flower which draws out the sweet. It's not he who reads most, but he who meditates most, who will prove the choicest, sweetest, wisest, and strongest Christian, really had a way of putting these things. And then the last reason, the last uh, note to his reader that he gives, he says, No, that is not in the knowing, nor in the talking, nor the reading man, but the doing man that will at last be found the happiest man. John thirteen seventeen. If you know these things, Jesus said, Blessed are you if you do them. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. He says, reader, if 
it is not strong upon your heart to practice what you read, to what end will you read? To increase your own condemnation? If your light and knowledge be not turned into practice, the more knowing a man you are, the more miserable a man you will be on the day of recompense. Your light and knowledge will the more torment you than all the devils in hell. If you should ask me what is the first, the second, and the third part of a Christian, I must answer action, action, and action. It's the man that reads that he may know, and that labors to know that he may do, will have two heavens, a joy of heaven, peace and comfort on earth, and a heaven of glory and happiness after death. Then he writes, for a close, remember this, that your life is short, your duties many, your assistance great, and your reward sure. Therefore, faint not, hold on, and hold up in ways of well-doing, and heaven shall make amends for all. I shall now take leave of you, when my heart has, by my hand subscribed, that I am your loving pastor under Christ, according to all the pastoral affections and encouragements of our dear Lord. What a wonderful memoir and uh, the life of Thomas Brooks as we come to study uh, this book. Maybe this has whet your appetite and you can go and research some more on the life of Thomas Brooks. The next slide, and I'm watching the time, we're nearly done. Main observations of this book, and again, perhaps for the last time we'll use all this old language, uh, although I'll make our headings going forward in his original uh, uh, writing, and then we can uh, break it down and simplify it to 21st century English. Main observations, that Satan has several devices to deceive, entangle, and undo the souls of men. And he says, I shall, number one, prove the point. Number two, show you his several devices, and there are several, believe me, and show you the remedies against these devices. And he takes each device, if you've looked at the book, and there are three, four, five, six, and seven even remedies against each device of Satan. And then show how it is that Satan has so many devices and lay down some propositions concerning, concerning Satan's devices. Next slide, and uh, just going to look at two verses there uh, in what he calls the proof of the point. In other words, Satan has devices, and we need to know them, and we're going to look at remedies as in how, he says, the proof of the point. And there, there are three verses. You could look at the one in Revelation in your own time, the first one being Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And he notes that the schemes of the devil here is an emphatic word. And three things about that. It, 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 it signifies firstly that snares are laid behind us. Treacheries that come from the back by surprise, almost like an army that's being ambushed from the back and they've been totally unaware to be ambushed with the advantage of the element of surprise. And that's how Satan plans his devices. Secondly, it signifies snares that are just on our road. And the way which we work and in your daily walk and in your workplace, uh, you're just going along the road, not expecting trouble and and as it were, thieves jump out and catch the man unawares just on his normal road. And so Satan waits for you. And he plans ahead as he sees what you're doing each day. And Brooke says he lays these snares for you like thieves coming upon you or because you're wondering and thinking about something else and not paying attention to the road, you fall into a pit, that kind of ideas. And then finally, it signifies being snared by careful plotting. To snare, set a snare, to take the prey at the greatest advantage possible. Brooks notes that Satan does more harm in sheepskin than as a roaring lion. 2 Timothy 2.26 They may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do their will. And somebody who falls into grave sin 
does so gradually, and this is one of the devices that he brings out, uh, the little sins, and where you perhaps present where these sins are committed, but you're not a part of it, and you come a little more comfortable with that. And Psalm 1 speaks to this, doesn't it? How blessed is the man who does not even walk in the counsel of the wicked. Yes, I was there when these things were happening. I was not participating or sit in the seat of scoffers or stand in the way of sinners. There's a progression how Satan ensnares us and you open your eyes and you've fallen into the very sin that you thought you were totally immune to. Like a military word being taken alive or captured, like a drunk or sleeping man to be awakened sober, to come to his senses after being ensnared and captured. And Brooks says, Satan has snares for the wise and snares for the simple, snares for hypocrites and snares for the upright, snares for generous souls and snares for timorous souls, snares for the rich and snares for the poor, snares for the aged and snares for the youth. Happy are those souls that are not taken and held in the snares that he has laid. And uh, in this week, let's go back and you can read the introduction, what we've gone over today. Uh, there's no history in this book, but you'd have to just Google if you want uh, to get any more of that. And um, our time is gone. And so next week, Lord willing, we'll start by looking at the first three devices of Satan and their remedies. And, and uh, I'm not prepared for that lesson yet, but uh, we'll see how it goes going forward, whether we can actually manage three, some are longer than others, and we'll just work our way through. There's no rush to finish this book, and so I trust that the Lord will um, use this book and our study in this to be helpful for us to be aware of Satan's devices, and those precious remedies which can all be found in the Lord's Word. Well, time's up, so let's close and... Uh, Trust that God will bless our study going forward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word, how we thank you for the many warnings that come to us uh, to be prepared at all times, to immerse ourselves in your word, to take your word and delight ourselves in it, to hide it in our hearts that we may not sin against you. Lord, we pray that this book would be useful in our study, to know that our enemy prowls around like a roaring lion. And he comes to us even where the way that we don't recognize him, even in sheep's clothing. Lord, keep us from sin, we pray. Bless us now in our fellowship together. Would you bless the preaching of the word for Pastor Sam as he comes, preaches your word. Be with Pastor George as he preaches uh, away today. We pray that your word may accomplish all that it is sent for. And we pray, Lord, that you would come by your Spirit and be with us in our worship, that we may worship you, that we may delight to be in your presence. We pray these things in Christ's name for his glory. Amen. Thank you all.